take out your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to speak on one of the most familiar passages, I think, in all of the Bible. It happens to be one of my favorite. Um, I think if, if someone were to take from me everything in the Bible and, um, and give me just this passage, I think I would still, um, I st- still think I know, would know everything about what God thinks of me, how God loves me, how God cares for me. This is a familiar passage of the three lost things. Three lost things, lost sheep, lost coin, and, and a lost son. The passage was laid on me this summer, I guess. Um, my wife and I traveled to the West and um, spent a week with our children celebrating an anniversary and uh, then visited a host of friends all over the West, just all over the West we have friends. And one of the common concerns that came up in every visit, every conversation was my kid. Um, one family, three children, five weddings, all of them in church. Um, another family, four children, terribly successful, none of them in church. And that just kept on repeating itself wherever we went. Um, the same story, one in church, three not, two in church, one not. And uh, our own heart was, um, was in the same direction. We would tell the story of our children, two in church, And one not. And the question that always, always surfaced is, what does God think of them? Where are they at in God's heart? If they're not in church, does God still love them? Hmm. I've been coming to this church for some 20 years. Um, I think back in the 80s already, we started our ministry in Essex. And um, would come here quite regularly, the days of Pastor Peter Nikolai. And um, if I think back to 20 years ago, pews were packed and um, church was full. And I don't know why everybody, uh, those who have left, have left. But what's happening in this church is happening in churches all over the country. We're seeing holes where our kids used to be. And we're asking questions like was asked in a book club I attend. How do we get them back? And what do we do about it? I just want to talk to you this morning about God's heart for lost people. And not suggesting that the empty seats in this church are the places that uh, used to be occupied by people who are now, now lost. Not at all. Uh, But I'm observing that more and more of our children aren't in church, and maybe they're in other churches, but they're not in our churches, and many of them have chosen another pathway than the pathway that that we follow, that you've chosen to follow, that you raised them with. So listen to these stories this morning, because I think better than any other stories in the Bible, talks about how God thinks about, about me and you and our kids and a world that is all over and sometimes not near to him. So, I'm going to ask that the person at the booth uh, just follow through with me as you place the words on the screen. And I'm just going to walk through this passage with you. Starting at Luke chapter 15, and we're only going to read partway through the parable of the lost son to the youngest son's return home. Um, What follows after that is a subject for another sermon. So it begins this way. It begins this way. Now, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. That is Jesus. Now picture it. He's somewhere perhaps outside of Jerusalem, You can picture him anywhere you like, but there's a huge crowd of people coming around him. There's tax collectors and sinners that are described as. His disciples are are nearby, undoubtedly. And then off on the sidelines, there's a group that are called tax collectors and sinners. And everybody's listening to this teacher who, who who has wowed and marveled people all across the 
country with his, his stories, his talk about God, um, his, uh, his, his invitation to know God in a different and, and in a deeper and more profound way as a God who is their father and who loves them. And there's a group of people that are attracted to him, but they're not the normal people that come to churches on Sunday mornings, that go to the synagogue. They're described as tax collectors and sinners. Now, who are they? Who are the tax collectors and sinners? Sinners, it's an interesting, uh, we're going to notice something interesting. In in, uh, Middle Eastern culture and in Jewish religion, there was a, a circle on the inside of those who were in, And then the circles went out and out and out of those who were out. Those who were acceptable, those who weren't acceptable, those who who you would admire and others you would say, well, it's them again. And um, on the inside are the Jewish leaders, those who practice the Jewish faith. And as the circles expand, they become more and more people on the periphery, people on the outside, tax collectors, Sinners. Uh, sinners would be just anybody who doesn't follow the Jewish law, doesn't practice Jewish religion, doesn't engage in, and they could be Jews, they could be Gentiles, and there's a whole range of people in this category that, that just are, are on the outside looking in. And they're the ones that are gathered around Jesus this particular morning. And then this other group called the tax collectors, and they're, they're, the, most, they're the most reviled people in this circle. Because they're the people that have sold, well, they're, they're Jewish people who have taken on the job of collecting taxes for the hated Romans and um, have sold their property and their birthright in order to be able to pay for this position. And then they continue to rip off their, their fellow Jews. So they're, they're hated. And Jesus says, as we read it, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, muttered. He, this man, that's Jesus, welcomes sinners and eats with them. This man welcomes sinners and eats. You just get a flavor of that for a moment. The, uh, those who, who sort of keep an eye on things or keeping an eye on Jesus and that day they say, look what he's doing. He's eating with the bad guys. He's eating with the people, the disrespectables. So you get that picture. Uh, that's the scenario. And Jesus does what he often does. He, he tells stories that will give some perspective about how, these, how God sees these people. Three stories. Um, Parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin. We're going to go through those quickly. And then the parable of the lost son. And um, in each of those stories, you're going to see three things. Something is lost, and then you're going to see that someone prizes them immensely and is seeking them. And then they're going to see this, that when they are found, there's a tremendous celebration. So let's read the first parable. Then Jesus told them this parable something they can all identify with. Now, supposing, supposing that one of you has a hundred sheep and loses just one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home and then he, he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I tell you that In the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So everyone in that culture would understand this story and everyone listening in this audience would make the attachment. Jesus is talking about a shepherd. And who's the shepherd? Uh, they understand the shepherd uh, quite well because they've, they've quoted the psalm, the psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so here in this soft kind of story, 
A story is something that points, a parable is something that points to something, something deeper, something, something uh, else other than the story itself. And they would connect this to, well, to God. And the picture, the, the, the first question is, wouldn't you, if you lost just one sheep, leave the 99 behind and go and look for it? Well, Jesus says, hmm, of course you would, of course you would. And remember, he's talking to the people who are muttering. They're saying, why are you with these, these, these low-grade neighbors of ours? Um, you, would, you would leave the 99 behind, and you would go off into the wilderness, and you would search for that one little sheep. And when you found it, here's a beautiful picture. You find that little sheep, and you put it on your shoulders, and you carry it home. That's what shepherds do. All of a sudden, there's a different perspective about the lost, the children of ours, if we put our children there, the neighbors of ours, if we put our neighbors there, those who never darken the door of a church, those who don't practice religion very well, those who, who, whose relationship with God is questionable in, in our mind. And we have a picture of a God who says, my sheep, my sheep, my lost sheep, and, and, and picture him now over the, over the wilderness, searching and searching, and when he finds, putting it on his shoulder, coming home with a smile on his face, shouting to his neighbors, I found my sheep, I found my sheep, and Jesus turns the corner on that story saying, I tell you, I tell you, even so, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who re repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. The next, the lost coin. Oh, let me back up a moment because what you, I think, should notice in this story of the wandering sheep is that they haven't done it intentionally. Or we may put it this way. They sort of got into this trouble without thinking much about it. It just sort of wandered along through life. That's how they got there. And um, we see that, don't we? we? We spent the summer in Squamish, British Columbia, and Squamish probably has an average age of 30, 35 years old. You go to a restaurant in Squamish, and if you're my age, you feel like a dinosaur because everybody at all of the rest of the tables are much, much younger than you, and they're talking about mountain climbing and in the wintertime skiing and then mountain biking and fly fishing and all of those lovely things that keep them so attracted in life to places other than church. And they sort of wandered into those places, left home and became teenagers and left home and wandered into the places where Life is being lived. That's how it happens. So, so here we have Jesus just pointing a finger at them and saying, but now ask yourself the question, where are they? Does God love them? He says, oh, so much. Uh, lost coin. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And then she finds, when she finds it, she calls her neighbors and the neighbors gathered, uh, the neighbor calls the neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And in the same way, he says, There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of, a, of God who. Um, over one sinner who repents. That's, that's not so shocking, perhaps, that Jesus hears because they understand getting that kind of lostness. It was through no fault of its own, this coin. It's just, it's just a coin that fell off from wherever the, the lady who owned the coin had that coin and um, disappeared. And that happens to a lot of us. Um, just in the course of life, we fall away, start, start losing our interest. No, not even that. Um, just inadvertently, uh, we're no longer where we were. It's this parable of the lost son that is the most startling demonstration of God's love. There was a man, that's how it starts, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to the father, give me 
my share of the estate. Now, to the text, to the, uh, to the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law, uh, they would hear this story and they would say, oh, no, 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 don't, don't think that, don't tell us that God is, is uh, going to demonstrate mercy to such as these, two sons, and um, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered the wealth and wild living. And after he had spent everything, uh, there was a severe famine in that whole land and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen in that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And then we have a passage we'll come to in a moment. Here's the story that Jesus puts before these, uh, these, this crowd of people, the um, sinners and the tax collectors, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And it's a story that would horrify any audience of that day, any respectable Jew. A son comes to his father and he says, I want my part of the estate. And um, I think the, the, um, the reality, the teaching that Jesus wants um, them to... No, let me back up for a moment. I'm, I need a drink. <laughs> It's a shocking story, just horrendously shocking. Because Jesus presents to this crowd of people the story of a son who loses all respect for his father, all, all proper behavior, and um, would, be, would in, be insulting to, to all who, um, who hear this story. This son is one who says to his father, I, I'm going to, I want my inheritance and I'm going to treat you as, as, as dead. He wants, he wants the uh, property of his father before, uh, before he wants his father. And so, Dad, give me my inheritance so that I can go off to this far country, so that I can live life on my own. And everyone that heard this story would have said the father will never, ever, ever do that. In fact, there was a, I've been reading these weeks, uh, these past uh, few, few weeks um, around this parable, and discovered a ceremony called the Kazaza, a Kazaza ceremony. Do you know it? Whether it applies to this story or not, many of the commentators would say it does, but it's, uh, the Kazaza ceremony was a ceremony of cutting off, breaking someone who had offended the community and offended God, just cutting them off. And it was quite a dramatic ceremony. Um, if there was someone such as this boy... Um, the neighbors would take a bowl, a bowl filled, they say, with fruit, and um, they would take it into the town square and, and smash it on the concrete, and it was a symbol of being cut off and broken from the community, no longer welcomed into that community of people. So it's, it's, it's said in, in reference to this parable that when this son asks for his share of the, straight, the estate, he has committed such a horrendous offense that um, the only thing he could expect is this, the kazaza is coming, the kazaza is coming. Nevertheless, this young boy takes his, um, his, his loot, he sells his portion of the estate, a third for the younger son, two-thirds for the older son. He sells his estate. He goes to the far country. You know the story well. He lives a life of, of lavish luxury, but wild living, Jesus says. He blows it all, and at one point along the way, he finds himself in a desperate state, a desperate state. Famine has come to the land, and he's uh, He's hungry. He's run out of money. He's blowing his dad's fortune. He doesn't know what to do. So he says, I'm going to hire myself out. And that's what he does. Hires himself uh, to, a, to a Gentile farmer who raises pigs. A place no Jew would find himself in a pig pen, but there he is. 
So it's a description of someone who has gone just about as far away from home and about as far away from the values of the community, as far away from God as you can possibly, possibly get. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in church this morning who identifies in, with that kind of relationship with God where you say, I am just so far from God that it feels like I can never go home, but that's the place that this young man is, can never go home. Verse 17 says, when he came to his senses. And here we have something that some would suggest is confession, repentance. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'm going to set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. And so he got up and went to his father. It sounds like he's repenting, doesn't it? It sounds like he's had a change of heart. It sounds like he's sorry for what he's done. But I think rather that uh, this son is just trying to fix things on his own. Um has no intention of repenting of just of going home to see his dad and saying, screwed up, dad, screwed up really bad, but listen, if I can just be your hired hand, it'll be good enough. Just your hired hand. So Jesus, Jesus turns the story. He shows the kid coming, up, coming home as he got up. Uh, he got up and he went to his father And here's the touching portion of this parable. But while he was far off. (laughs) Just picture it now. A father uh, is sitting at the city gate waiting for his son to return home. And as when he saw, or when he was far off, Jesus says, when the boy was far off, he's dirty, he's smelly, he's, um, he's been in the pig pen, and he's far off, and the father's looking. <laughs> father's looking. And he sees the tiny little speck of his son coming in the distance, and, and Jesus says, Meanwhile, um, you know, the son, meanwhile, or, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and threw his arms around his son, kissed him. Ran and threw. There's no father in the Middle East who would humiliate himself doing that, but here's a picture of the father running, running with arms outstretched to embrace his child. That's God's picture for us, isn't it? Running to find us where we're lost, running to embrace us when we come home from being lost, running because his father heart never stops loving the lost son. That's the picture, you see. Never stops loving this lost son. Rembrandt painted a picture of this, um, and and there's thousands and thousands of pictures of the uh, prodigal son, um, the lavish son, the lost son whatever you want to title it, but there's thousands of pictures, Rembrandts of this boy broken and, and wasted and, um, and gaunt and, um, and near death, leaning against his father's chest, one hand over his shoulder, gentle hand in the middle of his back, that's Rembrandt's picture of the lost son and the father's embrace, but I think Rembrandt had it wrong. It's even, it's even more intimate than that. Jesus says the father ran and when he came to his son he put his arms around him and he kissed him in his neck. He snuggled that's the implication of this isn't it? That he threw his arms around him and kissed him. Prior to that the father's heart was so filled with compassion 
which is a deep feeling of, of, of that's my son, and oh, I love him, and oh, he's lost, and oh, he's home. And there is only an opportunity for the son to say what he planned on saying, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And the father says, shh. And he calls for the party. He calls for the party. Quick, bring, bring the coat, he says. Bring the coat um, and put on the ring, ring on his finger and send sandals on his feet and bring the catted, fatted calf to kill it and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they had a celebration. What a story. And what a story of the love of God. This morning we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, we, we see um, the endless love of God who will not let us go, who comes to be with us, to live for us, to die for us, and to give us life. If you look back in this story, it's filled with power and with beauty. The coat, bring the best coat, the father says. Do you know whose it is? It's the father's. And so the father clothes this lost son in his, his, own, his own coat. He says, bring the ring and puts the family ring. He reinstates him with a family ring. Bring the sandals. And what's evident in all of these pictures is of the endless, endless mercy and love of God who will not let us go. There are times when, um, you know, my wife and I will weep over the lostness of a son, but we know that God has not let him go. There are times when we look at the, at the um, pews of our churches and we see our children wandering from faith and we know God has not let them go and as we come to this table this morning we're reminded again of a God who never lets us go so let's bow our heads in prayer Heavenly Father thank you for the grace that you give to us as you come to us filled with love and filled with searching and filled with mercy we ask Lord for your blessing now as we come to the table and as we celebrate our life in Christ Amen